uh, I see you in a very small window in my upper right corner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Being patient. Okay, this should work. There we go. Wonderful. Okay. All right. Uh, everybody have it? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, thanks. Good morning, everyone. And I do mean morning. Thank you, fellow advisors, for being with me at 9.03 in the morning. And if anyone else accesses this uh, later on, um, thank you for stopping by. Uh, I am Scott Tuffyash. I've been the advisor for Avonworth High School's student news organization, which is the Avenue, since 2007. And um, the people that are joining me live here, uh, you know, I think part of what my talk about is today is, is how our school cultures are so different that some of the techniques that I admire all of you for so much, um, when I try to bring them back into my own school, uh, I'm always a bit mystified just how different our schools are. And that's a little bit of what I want to share here and why I initially thought, okay, I, I think I'll phrase this as advisor survivor tales, because in many ways, I feel like I'm just a, a yearly survivor. But as I started to process that more and think about what does it mean to really be a, uh, a good advisor, um, I think it's a roller coaster. I'm sure we all go through roller coasters as advisors, but at the essence of it is that we're aiming for thriving certainly for us as advisors, but especially for the people that we are advising. I think that's the essence of this. So uh, I hope to provide some strategies. Certainly I'll have some stories, but uh, my goal is to really try to um, move past just the survival stories and really emphasize where I think things have thrived. So, okay, maybe you're thinking why survival, right? Um, Part of the burden of being an advisor at the high school level is that you may or may not be a full-time media person, and I am certainly not a full-time media person. So this is my teaching schedule the last few years. 60% of my day, my focus is on my AP English language students, and that's probably even a smaller percentage than the reality of, of what I'm doing. 30% uh, is where I'm focused on my next set of classes. I usually have a little bit less of that. And that's the pre-AP literature course. And that's 30% of my daily focus and energy. And then 10% is my one class of journalism. And in my heart, certainly I'm not giving it 10%. But realistically, when I look at uh, the grading burden that I have, um, opportunities to work with students on, on uh, let's say essay contests or um, especially just out of class time, really trying to support the students in their growth as learning. I only have 10% of my day to really work with students mindfully and deliberately on journalism. You'll notice that I don't have advising on here at all. And that's where I really feel like it's sometimes I'm just surviving because ideally I'd love to have much of this pie chart filled up with uh, student news advising, but, but I can't. I have to find ways to be present as an advisor and then juggle very quickly. So if you're like me, um, you're a language arts teacher and journalism is part of your life. Um, I'm hoping that these slides really uh, give you some fundamentals. And if you're not like me and you're a full-time media teacher, I, I hope you find it interesting how our cultures compare. Um, because certainly when I've attended PSPA events, I've been dazzled by what so many uh, other schools accomplish. And then when I bring it back here, I try to figure out, okay, well, what's authentic to this school district, to these students, to the editor in chief and their view of the students that they have, and what can I reproduce? And then what can't I in order to really make this particular news organization work? So I would say the, the number one step to move past survival over into thriving is staying off the advisor island. And I don't consciously or deliberately put myself on that. But as I've grown each year, I think I've found sometimes that, okay, I'm on one. And I realize it. And then I remind myself to get off the island, to talk to people, to get to mentors, to talk to some of you that are watching right now, to just reach out and try to get some perspective. Um, because especially when we're the one person who's looking over student journalists in our school district, um, it can be very isolating to really try to think through it uh, in all the ways that we need to think 
as advisors. So especially for new advisors that might be watching this later, um, that's a worthwhile sort of mental exercise is try to figure out what does isolate you as an advisor. And if you feel whether it's anxiety or perception or whether you can really prove that you're isolated, no matter what it is, I would encourage you to reach out. And I would say start with, um, you know, the organization that's asked me to talk today, which is PSBA. They're fundamentally um, extremely helpful to keep you off of this place, which might look really wonderful right now in the summer if you're looking at this. Um, certainly, you're welcome to vacation there, but in your advising life, uh, I would encourage you to do everything you can to recognize when you're there and uh, don't put yourself there. So for me, the reason I was able to thrive at any point, it really starts with other people. And I have to start with this first person right here, Tom Steiner. He was the advisor at Avonworth High School for many decades before I arrived. And uh, part of what Mr. Steiner was able to give me um, was a really healthy culture with um, top tier ethics and uh, an incredible sense of purpose and mission. And so I inherited an organization in 2007 that had a long lineage of success and a long lineage of, um, I think, pretty hard news for a school district. So if you're a new advisor, uh, I think you know you may not have a Tom Steiner in, in your district right now, but you should look through the old advisors, reach out to them, um, try to get some perspective. And certainly things might have changed in your district, but for me, uh, he's really the essence of why if I've thrived at all, I've been able to do that. Tom and Helen at uh, CSPA were you know um, associates; they knew each other, and more importantly, Tom Steiner is still. Um, in touch with Helen Fallon here locally. And you'll find that um, if you find one great mentor, they probably have a few more that might be able to help you. And that's sort of how this list multiplied for me. So Helen Smith was the advisor um, at Newton High School in Massachusetts, and she was the advisor workshop leader at the Columbia Scholastic Press Association week-long uh, advisor session that I attended when I started. And that was incredibly helpful. And I found that PSPA echoes pretty much everything that I've learned there. Um, Ed Sullivan is still uh, in connection with that organization. That's a national one. Um, and so it's pretty similar to something like a JEA, uh, but it's another organization that can be extremely helpful. Um, Gretchen McKay is at the Post-Gazette. She's a, a food writer. Um, and most importantly, she had children in the district when I started. And so she just, accompanied me to my first Point Park spring, actually it was a spring journalism workshop. And it was just nice to have some support and also to uh, just get little stories about, you know, being involved in Pittsburgh media. Jane Blystone was uh, in charge of PSPA at the time, and um, she was very welcoming and really just helped me figure out what is good quality journalism for high school students. Uh, Helen and Heather at Point Park um, still around, absolutely, in many capacities, and they were really leading the media days fall and spring um, when I started in 2007. And then we move over to some names. Aaron, you can see yourself there. Um, Paul certainly has been uh, incredibly helpful. Aaron, uh, you as well. And for everybody else here uh, that's um, part of PSPA, I can't thank you enough um, because anytime I feel like I'm thriving and not surviving, it's because of your support. So thank you. And then from the uh, Center for Media Instruction, that's somebody else I need to thank. Because really, you know, if I if I don't have great support and resources like what Andrew presents, um, it's very easy to just end up scrambling if so little of your time is, is spread over this. So let me get to survival basics. So I think there's four fundamentals. And for those of you that are advising as well, uh, I'd be curious to, to hear um, you know, if you offer something similar to your students or you have something else in mind uh, with this number. But there's four fundamentals that I use to try to just keep the avenues alive, first of all, and then secondly, try to help it thrive. Um, so I'll go over those. And then secondly, it's building on what I just mentioned right now, quality resources. So the idea is that we're trying to create a good student journalism product. We're trying to maintain the quality that we've had from the year before, and we're trying to adjust so that it's true to the stories of that year. 
and then most importantly at the end, I know for me, attitude wise, um, I really became a better advisor after my first couple of years when I started to focus on affirming growth in everyone. And I'll talk about that more at the end. So my four fundamentals that I think are necessary for new advisors, and for those of you that have been doing this for a while, you probably have your version of this, starts with your mission statement and moves over then into funding and fortitude. Then we move to our publication cycles and finally our reporting standards. And this is for me as an advisor, I don't necessarily go over these details to that level in this order with an editor in chief, but certainly for me uh, on my own time trying to sort out how to help the avenues um, continue and eventually thrive. These are the core of them. So here's a mission statement. And what I really did was just borrow from uh, prior avenues mission statements. I also looked at CSPA and I go over this with the editor in chief or co-editors in chief each year. So I'll just read it. I'd be curious if you have a similar one. It probably would be. The Avenues is the official student news publication for Avonworth High School. Every effort is made to report news, features, and opinions of interest to the students. The Avenues is an open forum for student expression. All content decisions are made by the student editors. Comments and suggestions from students, faculty, administration, and community members are encouraged at our companion website, avenuesonline.org. So I do wanna add a couple brief notes here. First of all, this used to be the email address for the editor-in-chief. And a couple years ago, uh, one of the editors suggested, let's just drive traffic to the website. Um, why have my personal email there? And so that's a part of what um, the Avenues has been trying to do the last couple years. And I think many other schools tend to be a little bit ahead of us on this. Um, but uh, when we poll our students, really the, the best way to see the proof of all of this mission statement is through our print edition. And I'll get to that with our publication cycles in a little bit. Um, but the mission has really helped guide what we cover, where we cover it, and where it ends up. So uh, that's really one significant change that's, that's been there more recently. Uh, and we'll go on to the next step, funding and fortitude. Uh, you're looking at a low-res copy of an actual excellent photograph that's back on the student website. This was from a photographer a few years ago. Um, some of you might remember her. her name is Katie Bellotti. She's a great photographer. She's in her sophomore year, I think, at um, Geneva College now. Um, but she just had a, a little school news story, new signs posted outside the high school and, and took a nice shot. And, and why I want to show you this today is that really everything we do as advisors is about what's inside the school where we are advising student journalists. And so Avonworth is quite distinct than maybe all the rest of your um, districts, and I would say a large majority of districts in Western Pennsylvania and potentially even through the rest of the country. What makes it distinct, and this comes with positives and challenges, is that it is still district supported in terms of funding. When I first started, it was encouraged by CSPA and by a number of other voices, you know, try to get your own funding, try to get your own revenue source. And I thought that was you know, good advice. And so I came back and I looked at the students at the time, at the late 2000s, and I was trying to figure out how much of that process of creating um, our own funding stream, how much of that would be sustainable in this community with these students that say that they're interested in student journalism. So what I found is I started asking questions or taking a look at what had been there before, and especially in talking to Tom Steiner, was that this district expects their school to support student journalism financially. So that's not the same as quite a number of other school districts, and I'm extremely grateful that I teach at a place that the community values student journalism um, so highly that there's a, a fundamental expectation that the school will not cut funding. That was tested actually in 2010. So it was two years into being an advisor, and this is probably my most survivor of all the survival tales, is that a uh, public relations director at the time, he had suggested that most professional journalism organizations rely purely on advertisers, and, and that's very reasonable. So he had questioned why the school provides any funding at all for their school newspaper. Now, part of why he did that, I think, 
it certainly made sense. It was realistic to the profession, but also as a PR director, he was doing his job as well. Um, the student news organization at any school will sometimes put out content that is not good PR for a school. Uh, I have been extremely fortunate at Avonworth that all of the administrators that I've worked for have had a very high threshold of the idea of maybe the public square. Um, so if there is an editorial that is critical of administrative choices, uh, I haven't been pressured to censor it. Now that said, um, 2010, there's a uh, PR employee who suggests, well, if they're going to be just a separate voice from public relations, why don't they just get their own advertising? So I talked with the staff at the time. Um, I was a bit uneasy about making this a personal cause because my thought then is that the avenues goes where I go as the advisor. And I think there's a truth to that for all of us. You know, we're always somewhat responsible in, in almost sort of being a steward of carrying that organization from year to year. But we are there to advise student journalists we're certainly not there to create content. And then secondly, you know, we have to make sure that we have a certain place uh, that is distinct from administration, from other teachers, from our students, and the community. And so because of that, I stayed behind the scenes. The staff decided they wanted to go in and they wanted to talk with the business director and they wanted to talk with the PR director. And uh, they talked to the superintendent and they negotiated out basically uh, continued support from the district, but in exchange that we would start using ads. So, in, you know, many schools, that, that's quite amazing to think it was all the way until 2010 that there was uh, no expectation of external advertising. Um, but that said, so we added a managing editor. And so um, the managing editor uh, is a position that's kind of hard to fill at Avonworth. I think some of that even comes from the community that there's an expectation that the school will take care of this uh, rather than um, a separate organization. So I have a man managing editor every few years. Um, they've always been great, they've been fantastic. Um, but what we have to do is try to match the budget that is um, given by the school district. So that brings up naturally some questions about censorship. Uh, and that's where fortitude comes in. Again, I've been extremely, extremely, um, I would say lucky really that uh, the people that I've worked for either have had journalism training in the past or believe very strongly that there needs to be a separate student voice for journalism that sometimes will not be good PR. But we do have extensive talks behind the scenes about the impact of our content. And so what happens in these walls and what happens in this, you know, the classrooms and what, what's talked about in the hallways or what's talked about outside this building by students but pertains to what happens inside it uh, we have a tremendous amount of discussion, and I'll be talking more about that later on. So really, when getting down to the fortitude, I would say it's knowing what the culture is of your school. In, in this particular school, in this particular building, um, funding is something that the community expects to be there. And I don't expect that to go away, though certainly we always talk about that um, behind the scenes. And it's something that I try to monitor as much as I can. And what is the attitude of the administration about the school paper? Um, where at any other school district, you know, it might be a different um, experience altogether, but, but that's certainly why, you know, when I go to PSPA or when I go to other events, um, I'm always kind of trying to figure out what works when I bring it back to here. So you're looking at a, basically a, a handoff meeting. This is the end of the year. Um, two years ago. Uh, this was the editor-in-chief, Isabel Thompson, and that's the layout editor at the time, Caitlin Ang, and they are going over some of the basics of what the next year's staff will inherit. So that was, uh, there's Hadley Holcomb, and she took over the newspaper the next year, and that's Jesse Mellon, who took over layout editor uh, responsibilities in the back, and then there's some other of her staff around there, and uh, you know, trusted confidence. Um, this was ideally how it's supposed to go. That you know, when we talk about funding in the background, um, these people get to focus on the craft of journalism. And then certainly, I do talk with the editor in chief uh, year to year about you know where are we with funding? Uh, what does the content have to do with funding? Um, you know, what what are the challenges if we 
um, print something that is uncomfortable to the district. But I always let each editor in chief know that um, this is primarily a student newspaper. So don't worry about the risks um, without really thinking about them. And then if it's really worth the risk, then we go through the process. You know, we push a story that might be a watchdog story, um, really exposing something that the administration um, maybe isn't communicating clearly, especially. That's almost always the reason why there's a watchdog story. It's just communication. People just haven't taken what's already out there and noticed it. Um, but also there are just disagreements. And the school, again, has been extremely supportive of uh, that whole process of having real journalism done by their students. So uh, third fundamental publication cycle. And for my colleagues, um, I think you're also in a very different place than where I am too. Uh, I inherited an organization that was working with quarterly news magazines. That was Tom Steiner. He decided to make a change. That was not necessarily as mainstream as it is now, uh, all these years later. But you can see the most recent edition on the left, uh, a beautiful photograph taken by um, current editor-in-chief. And so this was actually the first news magazine that we didn't physically print since I've been there and, and, and possibly ever. Um, so that's a change itself when we're going through the process of talking about what that means for the student body. Because when we've pulled them year to year, um, our cycles have always been about when does the print issue come out? There's an expectation and some level of excitement and certainly attention um, given to the avenues when that print issue comes out. And, and now things, like probably for everybody else as well, now things are quite different. Hi, Grace. Sorry, that was my daughter. Uh, okay, so in the middle is uh, the Instagram account. And so um, we go through now weekly updates of the Instagram account. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, how Instagram came to be at the avenues there. Um, but simply put, social media is a different publication cycle compared to print. And especially if we're working on quarters, totally different sense of news reporting. Um, the website on the side, uh, it's never really had, I think, uh, a strong place in the um, student body in terms of you know, how they care about it, what they expect on there, what they hope for. Um, Hadley Holcomb was really instrumental in taking the website, which was designed by a student completely. You notice it's very minimal, doesn't really have that school news organization look. Um, it was actually done as a student project a number of years ago and then have the updated it a little bit. But usually when we poll for the people that do visit, they like the minimalism. Um, I'm always open to whatever the students want there. But the key to all this is, again, that we have very different publication cycles. And I would even think for my colleagues, uh, you know, if you're working on a monthly uh, cycle, it's quite different than, than weekly or biweekly. So the last fundamental uh, I would say are your reporting standards. And many of you do reporting boot camps or you have your senior staff train your junior staff. And I just don't really get that type of turnover. Uh, if anything, really when students, I think are sophomores, they tend to disappear from my program. And as, as hard as I try to keep them engaged, uh, it's difficult. Um, the school's about 500 students and there are many elective options and now there's even options outside of the school. So they're pulled in different directions. And so I might get students in as ninth grade, essentially cub reporters that are working through my class, but then they disappear and then they come back as juniors. So I can't really continue that sort of senior reporter training a junior reporter and then having them build. I have to find other ways to do that. So one of the ways that I try to have reporting standards is through that journalism class and really making the language of why we cover what we cover part of our conversation. So at the bottom, you'll see that there's eight core news values. I actually pulled this off of uh, the United States government's um, website in 2007, 2008. Uh, you can see the old layout over on the left. And um, I have a link to this too, so I'll share that with anybody who's interested. Uh, I use it in my journalism one class. They have to memorize all of these because what I want to emphasize to every journalism student is that storytelling is different than journalism. There's just a different need, especially through social media. There's a different need, desire, interest from someone who's consuming stories 
compared to someone who's consuming journalism. And if those blur too much, then we end up with larger questions about why we're looking at what we're looking at. So we try to use these terms. And they were things that it's, you know, overlapped with what any freshman year journalism school course might teach about why you cover what you cover, especially in the art and craft rather than the business. So we jump ahead. And in 2018, 2019, I had a fantastic Journalism 2 class. And many times I don't get a chance to run that class. But uh, that particular year, there were enough students, just enough. It was a tiny class. There's Hadley and the rest of her classmates. And what they suggested was that if we're going to be working through Instagram as the heart of the course, which we were, instead of the website, well, why not take a look at the core news values again? So we had a few classes of discussions, and we decided that unusualness and conflict were not in any way desired by the student body from a school Instagram account. Now, you know, as an advisor, you might stop and think, okay, well, you know, what's the impact of that? Should we be trying to advocate for those? Should we be integrating those because they're better ethically for journalism? We discussed that and we thought, okay, you know, it's fine to meet the needs of students here on this Instagram account because that's where we will meet our students. That is where they'll engage in avenues first. And I would say that's still true here in 2020. And I'll let uh, Danica and Kiara, who should be joining me a little bit later, um, I'll let them talk more about the Instagram account when we get to there. So uh, those reporting standards are there. And that's what, again, uh, we work on in journalism class. OK, so those are my four fundamentals, mission statement, funding and fortitude, publication cycles, and reporting standards. And for the veterans that are joining me, uh, you know, thank you for humoring me because I'm sure you understand all that content. But if there's anybody who's new, um, certainly you can ask me more questions because I'm going to pivot now over into the world of resources. And especially if you're not a full-time media teacher or you know, even if you are, there's such a, a vast spread of news resources for us as adults that I think it does take some deliberate thinking to sort out, okay, why am I looking at what I look at? And we've been through a decade of uh, filter bubble thinking, you know, the idea that we only consume really what we want to see rather than what challenges us. And even if we are saying, well, what we want to see is what challenges us, um, it's still difficult to have a good sense of why we're looking at certain content. So I have a real wide range of sources to try my best to get as many voices as I can. And I certainly have to thank my wife and my children because you know it does take some time to read all of this. Uh, so here's some resources. So I'd like to start first um, with you know, the people that are joining me and the people that asked me to talk. Um, so PA School Press, uh, if you're not a member and you're viewing this, you should sign up right away. It's free this year. And that's a great opportunity to start to see all the resources that will help you avoid the island. And then if you are a member and you're watching this, um, make sure to participate. Uh, the regional workshops are fantastic. If nothing else comes out of a regional workshop other than your staff looking like my staff, you can see the joy in the photo there. That's already been some sort of bonding. And I, and I know in different schools, sometimes you know, your boot camps might serve as that bonding experience. At Affleworth, it's incredibly hard for me to get the staff together. All of these people uh, had or have different passions and interests and demands. And so uh, there's only so much time I get to really pull kids in. I very rarely have a student who is purely avenues first and foremost and whatever else they're interested in is a deep second or third. It's almost always avenues is 1A. Uh, so because of that, something like uh, the regional workshops at Point Park or whatever region, if you're in Pennsylvania and you're watching this, um, they are incredibly helpful. And I've been extra uh, fortunate that some of the faces in here have been extremely talented and won their region. And so you'll see pictures from the state competition across here. Um, there are write-offs, and uh, if you're new, I would encourage you to get onto PSBA's website and to look at the practice prompts. They are a great way to set a high bar for your reporters about what they can do as student journalists. And if you'd like, I can send you some of my past winners because I use them, and they're one of the most valuable resources I have. It's the, the great work of prior students because another student can see you know, it's achievable. They can do that. 
So next is Pointer. Uh, this past May, there was a session that kind of caught my eye. And more importantly, it caught my eye because not only was it interesting and professional, but it was also free. So Kelly McBride is a senior vice president and the chair of the Craig Newmark Center for Ethics and Leadership. If the name isn't familiar, that's Craig of Craigslist. And so um, she has a pretty significant role in terms of this organization, which is an organization to really comment on or teach quality journalism to professional journalists. And there's a branch of it that I'll go over that, that specifies uh, more content for high school or college. Um, but this session was fantastic. Uh, it was um, very sharp, you know, very much about the exact current experiences that were happening in May across the country. And even more importantly, I was the only high school news advisor there. Uh, the other attendees were news directors from mainstream media in Florida or Texas or New England. They were freelance journalists that were, you know, filing pretty frequent contributions to uh, in AP Wire stories. So um, this was a really professional, um, almost to some degree business driven um, session, which I just don't normally have access to. And so hearing someone comment about ethics and also the, the needs of keeping the business alive, it was so helpful. And I would encourage all of you, uh, if Pointer's still free, to get on there and to attend a session or two. Um, it helps you as a journalism teacher immensely, um, but also as an advisor to just to get a sense of what the professionals are doing. There is a high school and college branch as well. Taylor Blatchford is the person who is in charge of it. And I believe these usually come out weekly. Um, she's running something called Newsroom by the Bay, which is in Stanford, but this year, as she wrote on the right, it's Zoom University. Um, her resources are equally great. Um, and more importantly, it's a little better sense of what our students will be going through rather than some of the other pointer resources, which are very much about adults um, out in the field uh, or working through Zoom. Um, trying to do journalism and, you know, make a living at it. And uh, I have to thank the large organization that, um, you know, gave the platform for PSPA. This is uh, two screenshots of one of the best emails that I encountered over the last couple months. And the reason why it was one of the best came from CMI. It's a huge list of great resources, very professional. And there's Pointer. And when I clicked on that, uh, when I received this email, I found the session that I referenced to you. Uh, if you're a new advisor, um, this is a great way to stay off the island because each one of these organizations are filled with professionals that spend more time daily on journalism than you. And if you'd like to move from surviving to thriving, that's the essence of doing uh, high quality work as advisors. We, we just don't have enough time. So um, pick one, jump in there, read it, sort it out. If you have questions, go back to other people and ask questions and then just continue to use high quality sources like everything that's listed there. And, um, you know, if the CMI wasn't here, it'd be really hard to have such a um, cohesive voice for these sorts of outlets. Neiman Lab is from Harvard. Um, it gets philosophical at times. It's also very business driven. It's international and it's um, such a wide scope that I find stories in here that are incredibly helpful for me just as an advisor thinking about what it's like for professionals. So if I do have a student who's interested in going into the profession, I have a sense of what they're going into. Um, and for the other advisors, if you haven't heard of this before, it's a free email. Very, very interesting. I would encourage you to sign up for it. Uh, one of my favorite resources right now is Back Through Pointer. It's a daily briefing, and it was extremely COVID-centered back when we were on, you know, full shelter in place. But if you look at the headlines on the right side, um, you can see that Al Tompkins uh, has branched off, and he still weaves back in what the COVID-19 impact is on these threads. But this is essentially like sitting with a professional news director or um, uh, you know, 20th century editor in chief at your newspaper, and then just hearing here are the stories of the day that I think you should cover, and here's the ones that are not being covered, and here's why I think you should cover it. It is um, thoroughly professional. It's a little bit anecdotal in a, in a kind of a old fashioned, charming way, but more importantly, um, it is so thorough. Like today, it was full coverage about 
um, international students not being able to be in the United States if their university goes to an online format. And then a couple other threads through there. Um, it's free, it's very well done, and uh, I look forward to actually using it with my high school students when we return in August. So I'm gonna go pretty fast here as well. Um, for the other advisors, uh, I would imagine you've probably gone through some sort of you know, sense of what's your bias, but um, here's the resources that I use for that. First of all, way back in 2016, um, this was the patent lawyer that created the first media bias chart that really floated around Facebook and then made it just generally on the internet. Um, she started her own company off of that initial chart and you can go to her website to find it. Um, she tends to lean a little left personally, but she tries to be objective and about it. And I think also um, it's very uh, academic. So that can be a little bit difficult for some people. Allsides.com picked up that concept and I think made it more about the user rather than more about sort of philosophically sorting out how to consume. So you can see their truncated chart. And what I really like about allsides.com in terms of bias is that they show you where they get their number from, from their users, and you can agree or disagree and, and really get into why a number shows up. So as far as international reads, I think it's useful to have some of them. Um, Inkle is a free uh, resource for teachers specifically. Um, you do have to be mindful when you're consuming it because when you're in there, uh, they do have state-sponsored media. So something like the South China Morning Post, which is certainly not purely objective journalism, uh, that will show up just the same as you know, a for-profit news organization in the United States or uh, Australia. So uh, it's a great way to take a step out of our national coverage and to get a real sense of what's happening in the world. They do a weekly wrap and they also do a morning edition. It is free for teachers. Uh, I like to skim through Reuters breaking views. I do not have a significant financial background. And if you're somebody who does not really enjoy that sort of world, this is helpful to just get a sense of what's happening there. Because so often what's happening in the financial world works its way over into government and works its way over into culture. And the next thing you know, as an advisor, we're, we're fielding a story from a student who may not have a full grasp. And you know, as an advisor, we ourselves, we might not have a full grasp of how the Fed keeps the yield curve controlled, you know, in their back pocket, for instance. So, um, you know, I try my best with this. And then if I feel like I have no idea what's going on, then, then I try to reach out to somebody else to keep myself off a financial island. So US-based sources, uh, these are two that are more email-based and they're certainly web-based, there's no print. Um, for millennial business people, uh, there's a very targeted um, news source called The Hustle. And I found them to be uh, deeply informative because they have a real sense of mission and purpose. And um, I see content on there that I don't see other places. So I really like to uh, read that. Um, it's humorous, it's enjoyable. Uh, on the right side, um, this is from Gen Z students for Gen Z students. So just like The Hustle, it's got its own perspective and its own bias too. Um, it's a great sort of insight into how uh, Gen Z might want to cover the world um, in their sense of tone and style and content. So I would encourage both of you, uh, I would encourage both of these as, as ones for you to sign up for as advisors um, and just news consumers in general. So locally, uh, CMI has put together um, this website called The Big Story, and that is a conglomerate of some of the small, very small, um, local journalism outlets we have here in Pittsburgh. So, you know, the city paper we probably all know, but then there's also smaller ones like the new Pittsburgh Courier has always had uh, funding challenges um, in the latter half of the 20th century, but this is a home for them where we can actually get content um, driven by black journalists for uh, the Pittsburgh um, region in general. Uh, and there are a few other very sort of um, specific outlets that are on here. So uh, if you haven't taken a look at the big story, it's worth signing up for their newsletter. Um, the Incline is one that has some local journalists. It's uh, not locally owned, but it is at least working with local journalists. 
Patch.com, I believe, was a 2010s AOL venture into hyper-local journalism. So what's happening in your neighborhood, but not something like next door. So it's trained journalists reporting on the most uh, local of local beats. And so I find that useful to kind of skim through. Um, and Pittsburgh Current as well. Uh, they're you know pretty similar to the um, city paper. And of course, the regular is Post-Gazette, Trib Live, and all the mainstream um, broadcast stations. Okay, last thing I'd like to say before, uh, hopefully we can have Danica and Kara join, join me here. Um, philosophically, as an advisor, when I've been in survival mode, especially the first couple of years, uh, I don't know how really attentive I was to the needs of my editor-in-chief or the school community um, I tried to err on the side of uh, the purest of ethics. And so if there was a negative editorial, I thought, okay, well, don't censor it. Don't, don't, don't get involved in any of that. Just let it be, and then things will work through. And uh, I found myself in meetings every once in a while, and the meetings were uh, collegial, professional. If they weren't, I think they had valid criticism. But what I started to notice was that when I left a meeting with an administrator and I came back to a meeting with a student, um, I didn't really have a really good grasp on how to point out the positives of what they did in a very succinct manner so that they understood that people will not always appreciate your opinion, but there is a way to, to state it well and professionally so that when people disagree, there's nothing really to, to question in what our students create. And so I started to piece together a little bit of how I would advise when there's conflict. And what I tried to do is affirm growth in everyone. Because from the, the first time reporter to uh, a, an editor in chief who's thought about, for, for avenues especially, thought about a story for months, there's so many opportunities to point out where someone's grown. And that's what I tried to do. I try to model the climate. So uh, this was a slide that I gave Kara and Danica, who should be talking with me in a few moments here. Um, really, th these are some pretty robust goals and they're difficult. Um, if there are 500 students in our school, generally maybe 200, I think are interested in what the school has to offer overall, let alone what the school news organization has to offer overall. And I say that to the students every year that they might be doing great content, but that doesn't change a kid and their attitude about school. And so, you know, we really do try to do good quality human interest stories that are just interesting about people. But with all these goals, we realize, okay, well, you know, the, the climate might be challenging, but we can certainly do great work. And there's, everybody's gonna be a better reporter if you know, we strive towards good quality content in all of our platforms. And for me as an advisor, and maybe for all of you that are listening too, I find that the discussions are far greater than the product. Uh, I've really admired, um, for all of you that are attending right now, I've admired the work that you're able to uh, support and have your students create. Um, and I always hope that I can you know, equal that at Avonworth, but for me, um, it's the discussions that I have behind the scenes that I just treasure so much. Uh, partially, it's because all of these students will be media consumers the moment they leave our high schools. So yes, we're teaching media literacy. So why is something covered? What's the point of someone seeing a story? Um, considering a subject in a story, what they might be going through, what they say or don't say. And then finally, hopefully we encourage all of our students whether they go into journalism or not, to be really mindful about if a journalism source, if an organization uh, has a sense of quality in their reporting or not. Because the more students that graduate, they come out expecting quality journalism and then are willing to eventually pay for it, the more we'll have that journalism around. So here's my big list. And for the other advisors, and you know, you have a list like this too, and it's one of the the best joys of our profession as high school news advisors. And you know, we grow from the interactions and the discussions with all these people. I have grown so much um, from advice that I had or really didn't have for these three people uh, to right around here. And I would pinpoint here because 
Um, one of the keys for being an advisor at Affleworth High School is that the bell schedule, the uh, daily schedule, so we have day one, day two now, um, where people eat, when people are expected to be in the building or not, those have all changed. None of them are the same uh, for, they weren't the same for Ethan Woodville as they were for Ryan Johnston, or they were not the same for Hadley Holcomb as they were for Austin Hunt. And so um, as the advisor, part of my job, I view at Avonworth, is to try to explain growth. And we talk about what are the positives and what are the challenges. And these students learn so much about the history of their school because it has changed so thoroughly. And so it's exciting, but it also is uh, endless. And I think there can be some churn if I'm not careful. I, I try to be supportive, but it's certainly it's even hard for me to. And so that also, I think, changes my advising burden. I'd be curious to hear from the other people that are, that are joining us if it's uh, similar or different for you. But um, even the culture just changes so much that the basics of what a kid goes through, that it's hard for this person to hand it off to this person and for things to stay the same. And so with that said, uh, I'd like to stop here, and if Kiara and Danica are here, if it's possible for them to be added as co-hosts, so they could talk a little bit about their experience uh, in June and July, that would be great. Oh, there they are. Okay. okay. Hi, Danica. Hi. Hi. Good morning. <laughs> Hello. Good morning. Okay, so um, why don't you tell them a little bit about the stories that you've been involved in uh, since uh, you took over from Hadley? Well, in addition to the usual coronavirus updates that we've been having to report on, uh, we're also kind of reporting on uh, the invigorated sense of social justice that we're seeing uh, in the community and Pittsburgh, in the student body at Avonworth. And we've definitely been reporting a lot about that. And we've also been seeing a lot of uh, kind of uh, stories within the district, uh, school news stories, uh, like new teaching staff, new buildings, everything is changing. And there's the, of course, uh, the question of if we're going back to school in the fall that we've been kind of been covering. Uh, yeah, there's been a lot of news uh, <laughs> during the summer. I know this is unlike a lot of summers so far, just because uh, the atmosphere is changing with the virus. And so there's a lot of updates, like Danica just said, and a lot of teacher changes. And um, I know that like I went to some of the protests, so we've been trying to stay on, uh, like Danica said, like the social justice side of things and just kind of what's happening around uh, the country as well. Yeah, so um, talk a little bit more about uh, going down to the protests and then the content that the two of you made uh, from, from your experience. So I went downtown and uh, with my mom and my dad and we were just kind of driving around and actually I didn't get the pictures until like the very end but there were uh, it was approaching curfew around I think curfew was like 8 30 or 9 o'clock that day and so the police were setting up and there was a small group of protesters so I went down there and I took some pictures of the police officers and then there was a different day where I also went to another protest and I uh, this one was fully peaceful and it was just pictures of people speaking and the crowd and the signs. So it was really interesting to actually be there instead of just see it always on TV or social media. So then Danica and I uh, did kind of like a interview and we did more of in like the transcript form she can tell you about setting that up. Yeah, it was, uh, we set it up as a conversation between two editors, which was really interesting because it introduced us as the new co-editors of the Avenues, uh, while also uh, talking a bit about Kiara's perspective and opinions on a lot of the um, stuff going on in the news and with social justice um, and the movement itself, uh, which was a really great story that we um, kind of produced, got in the summer, got some traction from uh, social media and our Instagram page. Yeah, and uh, for Kate and Aaron, I think it's going to be interesting for us as advisors and for any other advisors that are joining us now. You know, so so Kiera and Danica went to an event off campus, right? Or Kiera went, um, and I think more importantly, so what is, what happens when we bring that back into our school? And we bring it into our school climate, and we bring it into kids that may or may not be interested in thinking about that in relation to their school, or maybe have subconsciously thought about it, but really just don't. It's not like part of their day or you know, the kids that think about it throughout the day and want it to be in school and want an, uh, an open platform for it. What will we do with those stories? Because they're intense, 
they have strong feelings. And more importantly for the administration, they're incredibly scary. So, um, so you know, girls, now that you have that content on the website, what else have we talked about for moving forward and kind of covering um, different kids' experiences with maybe either race or background at Avonworth? Um, I think it's important to kind of, uh, like when we did the protests, um, we kind of looked at just what was happening, like the objective view first, and then I was able to speak a little bit from my own experiences. So I think it's important to um, kind of give the facts and then allow anyone who wants to speak on their experiences or their opinions, because there's in Avonworth, we're kind of in like a bubble. And so there's a lot of people with the same type of opinions, but also it can be very uh, contrasting sometimes. So like for the protest, I know there's like two sides, like split in the middle a lot of times at Avonworth. So I think it's just important that when we cover topics sensitive like this, that we make sure that we present like an objective view first, and then we can have people speak on their experiences. Danica, did you want to add anything? No, I, I think that was wonderfully said, really. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I think part of the challenge we'll run into through the years that um, it's a very politicized topic and the school um, just has sort of, I, I would say like, and maybe girls, you can add on to this, um, pretty sort of like clear clusters of kids that have a strong voice. And then there's a periphery of kids that kind of just want to fall over into whatever area will let them sort of get through their day. And then there's the kids that don't care. Um, we want to engage all of those kids in the avenues throughout the year and whatever outlet it is, especially in the print one. Um, but one of the challenges that we run into at Avonworth is that uh, our students are kind of, they might be drawn in by drama connected to the, the journalism, but they might not actually read the journalism. And I don't know if Kate or Aaron, if either of you run into that situation at your schools where uh, kids like the, the sort of, the, they appreciate the circus of a reaction that's strong and then the reaction to it, but they don't actually look at the content. And so, you know, that's one of the things that we're trying to work on through the summer is get ready for a year where whatever we cover, we're going to have that expected reaction. So what do we do with the, you know, the fifth hot take on a super hot topic where kids are engaging and it makes an administrator really uncomfortable. So, you know, we're kind of working through that. I would say um, we're, again, really, really lucky because the, uh, the principal, I don't know if Danica and Kira, you saw uh, Mrs. Duola's email to you I today. Yeah. I did. Um, she's, she's super good. I and mean, she's just really trying to make sure that there's open communication and that things that happen behind the scenes that the girls get from her, they don't have to go through me and I can really stay in the background and advise. Um, and, and so that's, you know, sometimes that's luck. Uh, but, um, you know, I would say for any advisor, that, that, that's the key to it is just kind of, um, trying our best to, to juggle between what, what the students want and then what the administration is comfortable or uncomfortable with. Uh, and and we've, been, we've been fortunate so far. Um, so girls, what do you expect for this next year in terms of avenues? Like what, what do you think will be the um, biggest challenges and what do you hope for in terms of success? Well, I think that we have to be ready as, uh, as staff of the avenues to expect the unexpected with this coming year. Uh, really with the amount of change that we're about to face. Um, I think we're going to also face a lot with uh, the, the election year coming up. We're going to have to balance reporting on and prioritizing our stories uh, with um, everything that will be going on and that we know is going on and with the stuff that um, might just come up along the way. We're also uh, changing a lot with our social medias and we're really focusing on trying to get as many people engaged as we possibly can. So that's gonna be a new feat for us to get past as well. Just making sure that we utilize like our Instagram and the online platform and then work uh, the people who will become engaged with those social medias into our print edition because that's really important too. And we want people to make sure that they uh, keep the print editions and not just see it for a second and let it go. So I think just engagement is a big part of this. And I think this year serves as a opportunity just because of how many changes there are going to be with school. Uh, like Danica said, the election, just everything right now is changing. So mm -hmm. we're also finding that with the engagement, a lot of students are more interested in student journalism than they were in previous years. So we're trying to kind of capitalize on that engagement in uh, 
so many of the different news stories going on and trying to grab them, pull them into student journalism and get them on our staff and get them producing content. Yeah, we have an interesting space at our school because um, the fan section student account mm -hmm. on Instagram was like a student it was it was like another student news organization and just uh the girl that ran it is actually going you know she's going to be studying that uh in college but um so we had sort of unintentional competition but we learned a lot from them and i think more importantly it said a lot about okay there is actually a desire for this content from a student perspective through social media um because a lot of times in danica and carrie can comment on that but a, a lot of times the district pr whether it's through uh, Twitter or Instagram or whatever, I think kids notice it, but, um, you know, it just has a different voice. And so it'll be nice to try to get into that area and know that kids want it, which is really good. Um, anything else you want to add, Kira or Danica? I think that's good. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for joining me. Um, girls, if you have um, a little bit of time after we're done here, I just wanted to talk to you about what Mrs. Dewell had sent. That'll be really good. So you can figure out what to do next. Um, Kate or Aaron, I don't know uh, if, uh, you know, if you wanted to add any comments or send me any questions or anything. And then the Hadley's at the bottom. Hi, Hadley. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah, we had the most bizarre thing where you saw that picture of how the staff usually hands a year off to somebody else. And instead it was sort of, we're waiting for Hadley to graduate. And then I took what I usually talk to her about and then I put it into slides and then I had a Google meet with Danica and Kiera. So at some point, the three student names in the bottom, they'll all talk to each other, but uh, uh, it hasn't happened yet. Okay. Thank you guys so much for coming on and speaking to us. We are so excited to have you. Um, we will definitely share this recording for anyone who's interested. Great. And this was so informative, like so educational, and we're just really happy that you brought on your guest speakers as well. You yes. guys are definitely movers and shakers, and we can see it. So thank you all. I'll end the session, and then um, you'll. I'll let you guys know where the recording is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Okay, have a good day, everybody. Bye. Bye.